Take your Bibles this morning, and I would invite you to open to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to look at the first few verses there. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 1 down through verse 4. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we... Uh, to you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship and the ministering to the saints. This is God's word. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. May God bless us as we go to the scripture today. Would you bow for prayer with me here today? Our Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful to come to the church to hear from your word. So Lord, would you give us understanding and this, this passage and many like it, that we might be all that you call us to be, Lord, just open our, our eyes, our hearts, that we might receive truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for several weeks we've been doing a, a, a series of sermons on the subject of spiritual disciplines. And we chose as our theme verse for this series, 1 Timothy 4, 7, which says, exercise yourself unto godliness, or it's the, really the word discipline. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. This is a, uh, an athletic term. And the Apostle Paul is basically saying that whatever it takes in, in uh, athletic competition for an athlete to compete, even so it takes that and more for a believer, that kind of discipline, in order to be all that God calls us to be. And so spiritual disciplines, we said, are practices we do regularly that help us in our Christian walk. Uh, they, it's really replacing bad habits with good spiritual habits. Um, And this aids us in spiritual growth. In other words, we just have to do our part. We have to discipline ourselves. There are certain things in the Christian life that we need to discipline ourselves to do in order to be what God calls us to be. Now, we have looked at already the discipline of the Word of God, making sure that we're taking in God's Word and studying it, the discipline of prayer, learning to pray and seek God's face, the discipline of worship, coming together publicly and worshiping together in the body of Christ. We talked about the discipline of the Lord's Supper, that when we take that, we evaluate our spiritual life to make sure that we know that we're believers. And also the discipline of confession, making sure that we confess our sins and uh, make sure that we are living a clean life. And then the discipline of forgiveness. We talked about that last week, that we learn to practice forgiveness. Today, I want us to consider the discipline of giving. The discipline of giving. Um, now, I know that when we talk about giving, someone said that the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the one that goes from the hand to the pocketbook. A preacher was standing on a, uh, up to a, in front of his church, and he said, you know, he was talking about the church needing to expand and grow, and he said, this church needs to walk. And a man in the back said, amen, preacher, let her walk. And he said, this church needs to run. And a man said, amen, preacher, let her run. And he said, this church needs to fly. And the man in the back said, amen, preacher, let the church fly. And the pastor said, it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take money. It's going to take giving. And there was a quiet hush that came over the auditorium. And the man in the back said, let her walk, preacher, let her walk. (laughs) You know, we here at Grace, we're we're so blessed. Uh, We really are. And I'm not preaching on the topic of giving because um, I'm trying to have some kind of campaign and get people to give. You know, you know, honestly, we're doing really well. We're very blessed. It's because of you. It's because of your faithfulness. So if you're here and you're visiting, and this is the first time for you to visit at Grace, and the first sermon you hear is from me about giving, please don't get the idea that that's all we talk about here. Again, all I'm doing is I'm going through the Scripture, and I'm seeing the disciplines that God has given to us that we need to practice in our life as believers. This is just one. In order to be fair, as we go through the list of disciplines in the Christian life, giving is one of them. And it's not necessarily giving to the church. It's just giving. It's just giving to others. 
It's just giving out of a, a heart of love and a heart of worship. So I want to thank you for your already many here that do so much and have given so much that we are blessed. But again, we need to challenge ourselves, and we need to understand what the New Testament teaches about this. And by the way, the Bible speaks about this often. Did you know there are 500 Bible verses pertaining to topics of faith and prayer? There are 2,350 Bible verses that talk about money. So it's not like the Bible skips over this. In fact, Jesus talked about this a lot in his earthly ministry. Paul teaches the churches how to do this. In fact, a lot of Paul's ministry in the New Testament was going around taking up a collection for the church in Jerusalem. In fact, this became a priority on his missionary journeys. He collected offerings from the churches at Galatia. He collected them from the churches in Macedonia, Achaia, Asia Minor. And then he had delegates from each of these churches take this offering to the church in Jerusalem. Now, why did he do that? Because there was a crisis in the church in Jerusalem, a financial crisis. We know what that's like, right? A financial crisis, when something like that happens, how are God's people to respond? There was a crisis in the church of Jerusalem. Why were they having a financial crisis? Well, because on the day of Pentecost, you might remember when thousands of Jewish pilgrims came from all over the world. They came to Jerusalem, and at the day of Pentecost, how many got saved? 3,000, right? And then later on, Peter preached, and 5,000 more got saved. These are counting the men, but if you count women and children, that number really grows. And many of those pilgrims that came to Jerusalem did not return home. They stayed in Jerusalem. You know why? Because at that time, that was the only church in the world. And great things were happening at that church. Miraculous things were happening. And so they stayed there to be a part of the worship at that church. And so... Now what you have is you have a lot of people coming from out that the church needs to take care of. You have this huge church over uh, this huge church overnight. And these people that were there, they couldn't afford to stay in inns for long. And so some of the believers in the church there began to take them into their own home. And this put an immediate strain on the church as they were trying to absorb these thousands of spiritual refugees that had come into Jerusalem. But also there was a the loss of jobs. Because many of the people, when they got saved, they were Jewish people, and they were disowned from their family members, and they were put out of their businesses. And so suddenly you have a large group of people that don't have jobs, and they have no source of income. And so you have the church trying to take care of these people as well. But also to add to that, the Roman economy. The economy back then was causing people to be poor. The Roman Empire was basically charging huge taxes, taking the resources from these conquered lands, using them for them, their own purpose, and they were filling their own coffers with riches from taxes. They would send out tax collectors. They would take people in, uh, in their native lands, make them tax collectors. These tax collectors would go out and take a lot of money, more than it was necessary from the people, keep some for themselves. And so what was happening is this was causing a lot of people to be poor in that time. But then you add to that, that at this time, there was a worldwide famine. In fact, the Bible speaks about this in the book of Acts chapter 11, verse number 27. It says, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, and there stood up one among them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So what happened was there was this famine and I don't have time to get into all of it, but history records how terrible it was during this time. And the response of the churches in Acts 11, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto his brethren, which dwelt in Judea. They determined to help out their brethren as much as possible. So what we have here is Paul on his missionary journeys going out to these Gentile Greek churches, asking them to give to help the church in Jerusalem that had so many poor people. And you also might remember reading the book of Acts, the response of many in the church. Many people in the church of Jerusalem, they would sell things. They, they would sell their land, sell homes. They would bring the money, lay it at the feet of the, of the apostles, and they would take the money and they would give it to people that were in need. And pretty, pretty, in a, pretty short a pretty short time after that, they didn't have anything more to sell. So what you have there is a, a group of people, all of them are, basically in the same boat. They all 
have become poor trying to help out their brethren. So there was this huge need in the church in Jerusalem, and there was a need for the churches in the Gentile regions to help out this church. And so the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys made it a point to go to these churches and say, please, will you help the church in Jerusalem? And so he made this collection a priority. But also, he wanted to show the love of Christ. When you get saved, you love your brother. If you see your brother have a need, you help him out, right? That's what the Bible says we should do. And so Paul was teaching them this principle, but he also saw this as an opportunity for the world to see how that believers love one another, that there's no racial distinction, that the wall between Jew and Gentile was torn down, and these Gentile believers are sending money to these Jewish believers to show true love and unity in the body of Christ. That's the message that he really wanted to get out. You know, in Christ, there's no wall of perdition. There's no separation. We are all one. No matter what your background is, no matter what your nationality, what your social standing may be, we are all one in Christ. And Paul saw an opportunity to really communicate that message with this collection, so he made it a priority. And in Galatians 2.10, it says this, only they ask us to remember the poor. And Paul said, the very thing I was eager to do at the Jerusalem council, they said to Paul, Paul, tell the Gentile churches to remember the poor here. And Paul said, I was already eager to do that very thing. And so Paul then is going to speak to the churches about giving and helping others. And that's why he writes here in 2 Corinthians. In fact, I want you to back up. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, because really he starts talking about it here, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And let me just give you a little background here. Did you know that Paul wrote four letters to Corinthians, to the Corinthian church? Not two. He wrote four. Two of those letters, we don't know where they are, but we know that he wrote these letters. And we could call it letter A, which we don't have. Paul asked for a collection. Except Paul is asking for the church to help out the Jerusalem church. And then in letter, we could say B, which is 1 Corinthians. uh, By the way, they responded by saying, you know, um, how much do you want us to collect, Paul? How do you want us to do this? So in 1 Corinthians, Paul answers that question. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse number 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, that is, to answer your question that you asked me about this collection that we're making for all the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letter, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be me that I go also, they shall go with me. So Paul said, look, concerning this collection, you just, when you come to church, when you come to church on, uh, on and, you know, as it says right here on verse 2, on the first day of the week, that's how we know that the church, early church, worshiped on Sunday. On the first day of the week, when you come together, just go ahead and take up that collection, set it aside so that when I come, I'll take it, and I will take people that you appoint with me for accountability. I'll take them with me, and we'll go, and we'll take it to the church in Jerusalem. And this will be an offering of love to the church and to the believers that are there. Now, what happened was something happened to disrupt that. You know what it was? This is the, fourth, the third letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I call it letter C, which is called the severe letter in 2 Corinthians 7, 8. What happened was some false teachers got into the church at Corinth, and they began to accuse Paul of being a false apostle. And they began to um, criticize Paul in many areas. And so Paul had to write this severe letter rebuking the church at Corinth because of the way they were behaving. Sometimes pastors have to use a rod to chastise people in Christ. No pastor likes to do that. But Paul had to do it for a time because of the way they were acting. And he prayed for their repentance. And in time, the church did repent. And Paul got news from Titus that they had repented and things were well. And it rejoiced the heart of Paul that things, their fellowship had uh, continued and things were being restored. And so Paul gets back to the subject then of taking up this collection because, again, it was so important. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul now will bring up the subject again here in 2 Corinthians 8. Now, for a while, the idea of giving was dropped because of the tension between Paul and this church. But now he reintroduces the subject of giving to help these saints in Jerusalem. 
He wants to reignite their desire to do it. And Paul does it by reminding them that giving was an act of grace. Ten times here in this letter, he's going to talk about grace giving. It's, a, it's an act of grace. The motivation has to come for, for the, the grace of God in our heart because God is so good to us. You've heard me say this so many times that when it comes to giving, beloved, that if you have to do it like you're paying taxes, you probably shouldn't do it. If there's any reluctance on your part, man, just, just keep it. This is supposed to be an act of worship that comes from a heart of gratitude to God. So, um, you know, it, it needs to be an act of worship. It needs to come from grace. God should give us the grace to do this because we want to. We want to, from our heart, do that. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to point to another church that is an example of this kind of giving, grace giving from a heart of worship, a heart of love to God. Not out of obligation, but because you really in your heart want to do it as an act of worship to the Lord. So this is what he does in chapter 8. What he does is he gives, here's what I call the, here's the example of grace giving. He's, these are the encouragements, the example for grace giving. Look in verse number 1 of chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, <clears throat> we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches in Macedonia. Paul says, look, I want you to know this. We do wit. We want you to know, Greek word, which present indicative. We want you to continually know this. We want you to understand this. Paul is holding up churches in Macedonia as an example. These folks are able to give because of the grace that God bestowed upon them. That's why they give so well. They were able to be so generous. And again, Paul uses the word grace over and over again. They gave in spite of their circumstances. Look at verse number 2. How that in a great trial of, of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. What made the, the giving of the Macedonians so impressive is that it was in spite of great difficulty. He says they were in a great trial. This was a time of severe testing. They were under pressure. And, they, and also it says out of their deep poverty it means they were rock bottom destitute. This is a word that was used to describe a beggar that had absolutely nothing, that had no hope of getting anything. I mean, it's not like these folks were really rich, Paul says, but they still in their heart, they, they wanted to do this. And notice it says, the abundance of their joy. They gave not only out of their trials, even the fact that they were going through a trial and they didn't have a whole lot, but they did it out of a joy in their heart. That's the way you're supposed to give out of joy. I want to do this. It's unto the Lord. It says they abundance of joy. They abounded. And it says unto the riches of their liberality. It's a, it's a good way to say that this is focused. They made it their aim. Uh, they made it their desire. It's a generosity that is free of any self-serving motive. Paul said, boy, they really gave generously. And Paul doesn't mention the size of their gift. What's important here is their attitude and their sacrifice. They were generous in the way that they gave, not in the amount that they gave. God, godly giving is measured not in terms of quantity, but in terms of sacrifice. Some people give a lot numerically, but the question is how much have they sacrificed? There are those who don't have a lot, and they give sacrificially. It may not be as large numerically, but it was it was, it was a sacrifice for them to be able to give because they really couldn't afford to give that much. So they gave sacrificially. Look at verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So they gave to their power, Paul says, I bear record. They gave according to their ability. And the principle is, look, just give what you can. In the Old Testament, some people brought a lamb. Some people brought two turtle doves. Some people brought a handful of grain. Look, just give according to your ability is, what, is the principle of Scripture. And, and it says here that they gave beyond their power. That is to say that they gave what they really perhaps couldn't afford to give because they wanted to sacrifice in their giving. And here's a principle. All worship involves some kind of sacrifice. David in the Old Testament said, I'm not going to give anything to God that doesn't cost me something. All worship should involve some manner of sacrifice. And then he says, they gave enthusiastically. Look at verse 4. Praying with us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and to take upon us the fellowship of the ministering 
to the saints. In other words, they, you know, the implication here is that they gave a big gift and, and, and the idea was, no, that's too much or giving too much. And they pleaded with them, please take this. We want you to have this. And they were pleading with them, please take it. They were willing of themselves. They gave of their own accord. They enthusiastically, sacrificially wanted to give to Paul. And again, Paul's pointing to the churches in Macedonia that were giving this way. He's saying, you know, look at them. Look at, look at what they're doing. Look at the way that they give. Look at the manner. Look at the sacrifice. They're in trials. They don't have a lot. They give sacrificially. And, and in fact, they probably give too much. And when we ask them, please, not that much, they said, please, we plead with you. Please take this. That was the attitude in the heart that they had when they gave. Now, we see this in the book of Philippians because that's one of the churches in Macedonia. You remember when Paul was in a Roman prison and the church of Philippi loved Paul and they didn't know where he was. And finally, they found out that Paul was in a Roman prison. And so they sent up Epaphroditus to, to, to Paul in that Roman prison. And with Epaphroditus, they sent this huge gift to Paul. Because, you know, I think I told you before that back in that day, when you were in a Roman prison, the government didn't take care of you. You were dependent on gifts from people on the outside to even survive in prison. So they sent to Paul this huge gift through, with Epaphroditus. And when Paul received the gift, he was overwhelmed. And he wrote the book of Philippians, which is really a thank you letter. And he sent it back to the church at Philippi. And in that letter, he basically says, look, you know, your giving was like a, a, a gift, a sacrifice, uh, a, a sweet savor unto God, what you did. And Paul said, I'm so grateful for your gift, not because I want the Increase because I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. I know how to do well without a lot. I know how to do it with a lot. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I can do all things through Christ. I'm not thanking you because I'm rejoicing in a lot of what you've given me. I'm thanking you because your gift shows your heart for God. It shows you have a heart of worship. And this is fruit that's going to abound under your account before God. It shows that your faith is a genuine faith. It's a real faith. It's a sacrifice unto the Lord, and I'm so grateful for it. But I don't want you to feel bad because you couldn't give to me for a while. I've learned to be content in whatever state I am. You compare Paul's attitude with the attitude of a lot, a lot of high-pressured preachers today. We try to put a guilt trip on people to make them give. It is totally unbiblical to do that. The Bible doesn't talk about guilt giving. It talks about grace giving. You know, it's wrong for any preacher to manipulate people to try to get at their money and give their funds. No, beloved, no. It's an act of worship between you and God, you and God alone. I've told you already, I'll tell you again, I don't know what people give here in this church. I purposely do not look at the records. I don't want to know. That's between you and God. I know what I give. Uh, actually, my wife handles all the finances in our family. I think I told you before, you know, I know she, she gives me an allowance every week if I'm good. Sometimes I don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't care. That's between you and God. Let me tell you this as a pastor. What I want to see is true spiritual fruit for you. And, and, and regardless of the amount, because everyone is different, you know, everyone, give what you can, but whatever it is, do it as an act of worship unto Almighty God. And that's what the Bible teaches in the New Testament. And that's what Paul is commending here with these believers. And again, it's not always for the church. Sometimes it could be for others, other believers. I, I happen to know, again, I don't play detective, but I happen to know that there was a believer that gave a lot of money because of the, the suffering that's going on over in the Ukraine right now because there are believers over there that are suffering. And a believer that attends this church here heard about it and figured out a way to get some funds to some believers over there. You know what? That's wonderful. That's an example of the kind of giving that Paul's talking about here in the New Testament. You give when you see the need. This church in Jerusalem was suffering. They needed help. And these Gentile churches were taking up this offering, and they were going to give it to them. And Paul says, look, if you want to know how to give, Go look at, the, look at the churches in Macedonia. Look at the church at Philippi. Look at the way they gave to me when I was in prison. 
And they were grieved because they didn't know where I was for a time. They couldn't find me. And finally, they found out. And their flourishing happened to where they could give to me again. And they sent this gift, and they did it out of the sacrifice. And in return, Paul said to them, you know, my God will supply all of your needs. He said to that church, because you gave to me so sacrificially, God will supply all of your needs. And so they gave that way. And look in verse number 5 of chapter 8. And this they did not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave as an act of worship. They gave themselves. And here's really the bottom idea. God, God doesn't want your substance. He doesn't want your money. You know why? Because it's already his. He owns everything. Everything that you have is really his. The Bible says in Haggai, the silver and the gold, their mind says, the oh Lord, it's all his already. God's not a collector. He's a giver. But what he wants is he wants your heart. He wants you. He wants your devotion. He wants your worship. You know, I told you this story before, but it's to me the greatest illustration on giving. You know, when my son Jeremiah was just two years old, one day he was laying on our living room floor eating a bag of Cheetos and, uh, I had passed by and saw him, and I, I was bringing, you know, I, I was in my study, and my wife brought me lunch, and I was taking the dishes back to the kitchen like a good husband should, guys. And I was passing by, and I saw Jeremiah there. He was laying on the floor, and he was eating a bag of Cheetos. And so I lay down next to him, and I opened my mouth, and I said, give me one. Now, I know what you're thinking. Shame on you eating that boy's Cheetos. But they were already my Cheetos because I bought them. And I didn't want Cheetos. That was not the point. I, I, I could bury him in Cheetos if I wanted to. But Cheetos was not the point. I wanted to see how he would respond. I wanted to see what he would do. You know, sometimes some children can be selfish, and they can pull back and say, you know, no, no. But I laid down next to him, opened my mouth, and pointed in, give me one. And he smiled real big, and he reached in, and he shoved one in my mouth. Then he reached in, and he grabbed another, and he shoved another in. And he was laughing the whole time. I mean, He just kept shoving Cheetos in until finally I had to say, enough, no more. I don't want any more. And I didn't want Cheetos. What I wanted was his heart. I wanted his heart. God doesn't want your money. He already has it all. In fact, what you have, he gives to you. What God wants is he wants your heart. He wants your heart. And that's what Paul's saying here. They gave of themselves in verse number 5. They gave their own selves to the Lord. That's really the idea there. For Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. So, and they gave submissively. So Paul points to this church and says, this is the example. Look at them. Look at the way they do it. Let me tell you how they give. This is, what, this is the model for the heart of a believer that they learn to give to, to, to God. And then so secondly, there's the exhortation. Now he'll turn to the church at Corinth, and he will remind them. Look down at verse number 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Now, now Paul turns to the church at Corinth and says, Now, you all... You have so many gifts, and you have so many blessings. In fact, if you took time to look at it, the church of Corinth was a wealthy church. They were a seaport city, and they benefited from being in their location. And not only that, they were wealthy spiritually. They had so many spiritual gifts. They abounded in everything. And what Paul is saying is, look, God has blessed you as a church. You're so blessed. And you've you've abounded in some of these things spiritually. But one thing where you haven't abound, abounded, one thing where you have forgotten is in this grace. I want you to abound in this grace also, what? The grace of giving. In verse 8, he says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul says, look, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you. I'm not commanding you to do this. This should be something that shows your heart of love. This is what this should do. So he's saying to them, basically, cultivate the grace of giving. Learn to abound in this thing too. Confirm your love 
Do this out of a heart of love, a heart of sincerity. Again, I say, if you don't give out of a heart of love to God and a love for his people or a love for others who need help, then, friend, it's really no use. If you're going to give, do it out of the right heart. He says here, confirm your love and then consider Jesus. Look down at verse number 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be what? Rich. You want an example on giving? Look at Jesus. There's no better example in giving than Jesus himself. Jesus, for your sake, although he was rich, he made himself poor. That through his poverty, you might be rich. That's the idea. Jesus, who had all riches, left the riches of heaven, the riches of glory. He humbled himself. He came here. He lived as a man, a perfect life. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He took all of your sins upon himself. He made himself poor, and he took the debt of sin upon himself. All of your sin debts, he added onto his own account. And through his poverty, his death on the cross He paid your sin debt, and you know what? When you come to Jesus and you're you're forgiven, you're made rich. The sin debt is gone. Not only that, he adds to your account the righteousness of Christ. You who were poor become rich because Jesus who was rich made himself poor. There's no greater example of giving anywhere than in the life of Jesus Christ, our great giver who enriched us with his life. And so Paul says, look, just consider Jesus. There's no greater example. But then he says one final thing, complete what you started. Look, look down at verse number 10, and, and herein I give my advice. Paul, here's my advice to you, that this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Verse 11, now therefore perform the doing of it. For there was a readiness to will, so that there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. In other words, what he's saying is, you know, back before we had this conflict, a year ago, you made a commitment that you would help God's people. And then we had this conflict, and then these false teachers came, and then, you know, but now we're restored, and I'm reminding you of a commitment that you had made. You already said you were going to do this. So complete what you start. You know, perform in verse 11 the doing of it. Just do what you said you were going to do. We want to help out the people of God. And so the idea there is is that when we as believers make a commitment in this area, we should follow through with it. That's what Paul is telling this church here. If you make a decision to give tithes and offerings to the Lord, between you and God, you settle that in your heart that you're going to be a giving person, then just follow through with that is always saying here. But again, Paul emphasizes the willingness. Look at verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, not according to the man hath not. That is, just give what you can. But there has to be a willingness. This is the first thing. Let there be a willingness, and then just give according to what you have. Not what you don't, but according to what you have. Now, we're out of time, but I'll close. But again, I'll just say this. Through my years in Christian ministry, I've heard, uh, I've been in the congregation in different places all around, and I've heard different appeals for giving from different ministries and pastors. And again, I, I have, uh, I've had to endure a lot of those appeals, and I have to be honest with you, some of them are just plain pathetic because they present God as this heavenly bill collector who's going to beat you over the head if you don't do what you're supposed to do. And it's blasphemous and my idea. That's not who God is. God is the loving giver. He's not in heaven with a bank statement and a ledger sheet and a calculator looking over your funds. No, he, that's not God. Um, reminds me of, of uh, Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said he went to a church and he was stirred after a sermon to give. And after the sermon... Uh, after the sermon was a long appeal to give, and he decided he was going to give something, and so he reached in his billfold, and he took out some money, and the longer the preacher went on trying to manipulate people, the more of that money he put back into his wallet. 
until finally he was so put out with what the preacher said. When the offering plate came around, he took some of the money out. <laughs> because some of those appeals can be really, really, really bad. It's not what God wants. God doesn't want people to give out, man- out of manipulation or guilt or like you're giving to the government or anything like that. He wants there to be the willingness. <clears throat> he wants it to be a desire from the heart. And by the way, any religion or institution that makes you give that way, that puts that kind of guilt trip on you, that's just not of God. Remember, the woman in the New Testament, Jesus saw her come to the temple and she gave her last two mites. And sometimes we hold her up as an example. Well, wow, look at this woman. She gave sacrificially. Indeed, she did. It was wonderful on her apart. But Jesus, right after that, said, this whole temple is coming down. You know why? That, that religion, that system had taught people that you give the last thing that you have if you want to be right with God. That, any, any idea like that, any kind of religion that teaches you you have to give in order to be right with God or to, to, in that way is a false system. That's why Jesus said, this whole temple's coming down. It's become all about this. No. Again, it must be from a heart of worship that gives to the Lord Because you're saying, you know what, I'm just thankful to God and I want to be able to worship him in this way and I want him to know he has my heart and I want to help the work of God go forward and I want to help those who are suffering. And here at Grace, we want to send out more missionaries. We want to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, helping people come to know Christ. Let's let's bow for prayer together, friend, if we're out of time today. But this is the discipline one of the disciplines we have in our Christian life, the discipline of simply just giving. And part of our worship is we give to the Lord. And this is something we must incorporate. And it's not always to the church. We bring our ties to the church, of course, but sometimes God might give you a need of someone that's outside, a family that just needs help, a ministry that needs support, a believer that needs to be lifted up, The heart of the believer is one that's a giving heart. We give unto the Lord for his glory. And we remember our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the example for us. He gave so much that we might be enriched. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, friend, I I want to challenge you with this. He loves you. He, He came in this world. He died for the sin of mankind to pay the sin debt so that people could go to heaven. They could have that sin debt paid so that the wrath of God for sin is satisfied and God now is able to extend to you love and forgiveness. And you receive that when you put your full faith in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't done that, friend, that's the first thing you need to worry about. Making sure that you're forgiven, your sins are forgiven, that you're repentant, and that you've put your full faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that's the thing you need to be concerned about. And I would encourage you to do that right now. Would you just pray and say, Lord God, forgive me, save me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Friend, cry out in prayer, and you know what? He'll save you, he'll forgive you, he'll cleanse you of your sin. This is, this is what the church is here for. We're here to share the gospel with the world. This is why Paul was concerned about taking up these resources because he wanted to show the world the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All about the glory of God, friend. That's what it's about. And the power of the gospel. Changing lives. Father, I pray that you'll take these words, speak to hearts, and use it for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.